I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, how you first came to discover Bitcoin. And, you know, given that, as I mentioned in the intro, you ran the first uh, crypto fund, uh, what were some of your aha moments, so to speak, in recognizing the value of Bitcoin as you were learning about it? I'd love to be able to say I stumbled across crypto somehow and Bitcoin at the time, because this is, we're talking early 2013 now, and looked at it and thought, this is brilliant. And I put all my money in it and, and I've long since retired and taking care of uh, philanthropic activities. Unfortunately, I can. I started working for a, a broker, I guess would be the best way to describe it, based in Malta and doing something totally unrelated to any of this discussion. And they knew I had a lot of experience managing funds and they had just started a sort of a hobby. Uh, three of the founders had started uh, a Bitcoin uh, index fund. So basically when someone invested in the fund, they bought Bitcoin and when someone redeemed, they sold Bitcoin. So just track Bitcoin with a, with a fee or a tax as I've taken a call it calling it now, pardon me, of about 2%. I don't remember exactly what it was. And so they asked me to run this fund, and that was my introduction to, introduction to Bitcoin. And they told me what Bitcoin was, and I just, uh, I don't remember if I said it to them, but I certainly said it to myself. That's the stupidest idea I have ever heard of in my entire life. That is just, this is just ridiculous. Who the hell can do this? And so I went, I ran the fund because it was an index fund. So it wasn't a, the third part of the, of the three legs of a, of a fund stool in terms of making it work is where do you invest? And so this was an index fund. There was no discretionary management. So I didn't have to be a fan of BTC to do the rest of it. And I was good at doing the rest of it. So they, they or at least they thought I was. So they hired me to do it. And that worked fine. But obviously being a reasonably curious individual, I started digging into BTC. So I actually read several articles on Mr. Ponzi. I dug into uh, all sorts of pyramid schemes. I did an inordinate, inordinate amount of research into the tulip mania in the late seven, uh, sorry, very early 17th century or maybe even late 16th century, depending on how you want to describe it, in, in Holland and spread rapidly to other countries in Europe. And I did so much that this uh, company did an award ceremony in, in Porto in May and I was the uh, master of ceremonies for it. And the entire theme of the award ceremony was uh, Holland and tulips uh, because of this, uh, because of all the research I had done and, and how people were amused and how seriously I took all of this as opposed to just throwing some, throwing some money at it. So anyway, I came around and uh, as a just quick aside, because I, I, I've explained what Bitcoin is in particular in crypto in general to a lot of people, fewer recently because most people at least think they have a handle on it. But one of the, the examples I used was, uh, was really compelling to a lot of people and it may be mildly interesting at least for this discussion. And that is I refer to August 15th, 1971, which is when Richard Nixon finished what Franklin Delano Roosevelt started and completed taking the US off the gold standard. As a quick aside for those who may not know, after 1931, I think it was, it was actually illegal to own physical gold in the United States. It was a crime. People went to prison for it, which most people seem to have forgotten now or never experienced because they're going back a ways. But in any event, in 1974, a bunch of Greek colonels invaded Cyprus. And that sounds like a total non sequitur, but it's not entirely because those Greek colonels invaded from the southwest, took two thirds of the island, Turkey invaded from the northeast, took the Northeast one third, they divided, they divided the, the, the country into half with, uh, or two thirds and one third with a line that's now called the Green Line that ran through the capital of Nicosia, right through the airport, which is why this relatively small island of the Mediterranean is three international airports. But in any event, the colonels in the, in the Southwest, they, there was a currency there, the Cypriot pound, but it was an old style currency. And so they relaunched another currency completely from scratch. And it was the first one that was launched after 1971. And it's also interesting because it was backed by nothing. It was accepted and the Cypriot pound became one of the few currencies that was nominally stronger than the US dollar because it took two US dollars to buy a Cypriot pound. Why is that all relevant? It's because of the following question that I would ask people. Why is it that about 1.5 million people co-located on an island in the Eastern Mediterranean can simply declare by fiat that they have a currency and people accept it, 
and 1.5 million people who don't happen to be co-located on the same island floating in the Eastern Mediterranean can't. And there's really no good answer to that. And that was one of many angles I used when I explained crypto to people. But most people seem to find that particular comparison particularly uh, illuminating. With the notion being that Bitcoin now and cryptocurrencies basically allow people anywhere to do what the co-located people of Cyprus were able to do. Is that the thought? Well, that's going a bit further than I would go because I don't think that the term cryptocurrency, I don't think either of those words uh, really apply. I use the term trading tokens to discuss it now, but let's put it this way. There was a, there's enough overlap between what a fiat currency is supposed to do, right? Unit of, uh, unit of exchange or medium of exchange, unit of measure, storage of wealth. Those are the three traditional ones. I would add a fourth and that is a mechanism for transferring wealth, although most historical writers ignore that. I think that's very important in the, in the modern day and age, just ask Western Union. And there's not a single trading token or single cryptocurrency that provides all four of those but collectively, they're getting reasonably close, and Bitcoin clearly fills at least one, and if you use my list, two, two of them. <clears throat> but the point is, most people think of money as a medium of exchange. Uh, cryptocurrencies or trading tokens are certainly used to some degree as media of exchange, and no one's challenging their right to exist anymore. And when BTC is going for $10,555 on Bitfinex, I'm looking at it right now. Sorry, I'm not looking at the price on SFOX. The, the, there's a general consensus that's quite strong that there's some value here. So the, the, the fact that that value is, is generated by a global consensus versus consensus of a bunch of folks on a single island, a single piece of dirt, I don't think that's a, it's a distinction without a difference. Let's put it that way. Five, six years ago, it wasn't. So it, you know, we have to rewind a little bit when we start thinking about what everyone, how everyone felt about BTC or cryptocurrencies uh, five, six years ago. Sure, that makes sense. Um, I think maybe uh, something I'd love to ask you more about at this juncture, Tim, is uh, you, know, you were chatting before the call about how one aspect of your experience with crypto that's a little bit unique for the sector is that you have asset management experience that straddles both crypto and traditional markets, fiat, things like that, right? Uh, which I think, uh, at least to my ear, has already come across in your answers because, uh, as you yourself said, the way that you think about and explain something like crypto or Bitcoin is pretty unusual, um, even nowadays, I would say, amongst the explanations I've heard for it. So I'd love if you could just expand a little bit on how you see that duality of your own experience informing the way that you think about crypto um, and manage crypto funds. <laughs> Let me go back and give you the most bizarre uh, example I use, but actually folks uh, my age find it very, uh, very appealing and very understanding. I literally go back to Roman armies in Gaul when I start talking about cryptocurrencies. One of the points I make is that cryptocurrencies, they're not new, they're not innovative, they're not particularly, they're not particularly innovative, they're certainly not revolutionary, and uh, the roots of cryptocurrencies go back literally thousands of years. And the example I use is, is some Roman general rampaging around Gaul, and he needs to feed his, feed his army. So he finds a, a relatively wealthy farmer, uh, takes all of his cattle, and hands him a chit. You know, a, a, a term is actually became popularized during World War II called scrip, S-C-R-I-P. And it was basically an IOU. So, and we actually have some of these. They're written on, like, tanned hides and on tree bark. So this general wrote out his IOU saying, okay, this, this is good for two dollars, just which is the, you know, etym etymologically speaking, the origin of the word dollar, just got to go to Rome to pick it up. And you know, a dollar was worth a lot of money. So he took all his cattle and the guy's staring at the, you know, there weren't really a lot of currencies there. Most of it was gold. So this is a first example of a, of a, a non-physical currency. And I'm sure there was some guy who decided to 
buy all of those IOUs for 40 cents on the dollar, hike to Rome, bribe some senator with 20% of it and pocketed his gold. And, and there we went with a, a good secondary market. That's my speculation, by the way. But in any event, the, uh, the, the fact is that these IOUs, these scripts, were a parallel currency. In fact, my first cryptocurrency fund, I almost called the parallel currency fund. Uh, parallel currencies, in other words, uh, uh, different medium, media of exchange to uh, supplement hard currency and to improve over barter, which was the only other alternative, has been around for thousands of years. And that's really what cryptocurrencies, if you take them as currencies are, they're parallel currencies. They're used to replace fiat currencies to a certain degree. And I'm not a, I'm not a uh, fanatic who's going to say cryptocurrencies are going to displace all currencies and you know, Bitcoin's going to displace the US dollar. But you don't need to go there to have, to find a really strong place for cryptocurrencies. And that place has been around literally for thousands of years. One of the reasons from an economic standpoint, we had the dark ages for a thousand years, right? Since the, from the fall of the Roman Empire about 400 AD to the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution in the 17th century, uh, more than a thousand years, obviously, but rounding, is there was an expansion of M1. Uh, M1 was the money supply. The money supply was represented by gold and silver coins. Unless you happen to be sitting on a silver mine or a gold mine, you couldn't expand it. The easily, the easily discovered gold and silver mines had already been discovered in, in Europe. Uh, which is where, where generally the, the etymology of most of the modern economic thinking has come from. And so you couldn't have any real economic growth because money supply was fixed, except to the extent that some king or some lord decided to dilute uh, the, the amount of gold in a coin, right? And, and uh, makes, gen generates some more currency then, and then inflation took care of it because the value of that coin as it was, as it was diluted uh, fell. So you, it's really, really important to understand that the concepts behind cryptocurrency uh, as, a crypto, as a currency are not at all new. And, that, and if you want to go to tokens, it's the same thing there if you dig into where tokens are from. So it's by placing the crypto sector into historical perspective, it actually becomes a lot easier to understand because it's not n nearly as new or crazy or radical as folks that have less historical experience or less historical bent would have you believe. 